turning, as I mentioned, to the uh, story that runs on the uh, front page of the sports section in this morning's Guardian. It's been written as well about uh, uh, from David Kahn. It is an article by David Kahn on that uh, back page this morning. I'm delighted to say David joins us on uh, the line to discuss it. Good morning to you, David. Good morning. It's a story um, that you've spoken with uh, Gareth Farley, the former Republic of Ireland international, of course, that people would be aware of, and it uh, surrounds... Um, Kevin MacDonald, who himself spent a uh, 21 months as part of the FAI set up uh, with the Republic of Ireland around the time that Steve Staunton was there as well, and it relates to uh, bullying at Aston Villa. You might just, for people who are coming fresh to the story, David, just give us a bit of a synopsis of exactly what's going on here. No problem. Uh, well, I mean, I think the starting point for understanding this is that Kevin MacDonald... Um, Obviously, former Liverpool, Leicester, Coventry footballer, um, been a coach uh, for a long, long time. And he was at, he came to Aston Villa with Brian Little in 1994. And as you say, there was a period with Steve Staunton where he was, I think, the assistant manager of the Republic of Ireland. Um, last year, a Premier League investigation found that Kevin McDonald had bullied a young player at Aston Villa between 2015 and 2016. So this is in very, very modern times. Um, and they found that the player's father had complained to Villa. Villa had not dealt with his complaint adequately at all. The, the, the player's father had continued to complain. The Premier League had had an investigation and they did find bullying. And I reported on that, even though they didn't really make it public. Um, but Kevin McDonald was allowed to remain at Aston Villa but moved to coaching the under-23s, which meant he wasn't in charge of, if you like, mine, what we would call minors, under-18s. Uh, and many people did see that as very, very unsatisfactory. Um, and then um, Gareth Farrelly has now come forward. He was at Aston Villa. Uh, he came as a 17-year-old from Home Farm in Dublin, a home farm club in 1992. He was there for five years, he did make it to the first team, and, and yes, he was capped by, by Ireland at under-21 and full international. Um, but he is saying that when after Kevin McDonald arrived at the club in 94, he basically had a nightmare. Uh, uh, there was bullying, there was verbal and physical abuse. It was a constant battle for him to, um, to maintain his confidence, to maintain his uh, you know, his performances, uh, it left him physically exhausted. And he's also talked about looking back, um, that, um, he, he thinks that he was depressed and he, and he, and he recalled having suicidal thoughts. Um, and so, you know, it's a very, very strong on the record interview with those recollections about his time with Kevin McDonald, which is 20 years before, he was found to have been bullying a young player at Villa. Mm. It does seem that was the prompt for Gareth Farley to come forward as well. It, there must be tens of thousands of stories like this from football and from uh, sport in general. I know it's a theme that uh, Gareth and yourself uh, introduce over the course of the piece that a lot of players will talk about it, and we've heard them on this show several times, about that kind of behaviour being used in a positive sense for a player, that there's a breaking down of a player to create a blank canvas, and from there you start to build them back up again. But that was not uh, Garrett's experience in any way, shape or form. Yeah, and, you know, I think that that can be a really superficial view, can't it? Like, if there's, if there's bullying and abusive behaviour, and obviously what's happened this time uh, is very different from last time at Aston Villa. So last time... As I say, the club did not deal with the father's complaints adequately at all. They didn't take any action. Uh, and then the Premier League investigated. Uh, and then McDonald stayed at the club, uh, essentially almost promoted, really, to under-23 coach. This time, as soon as they got my questions about it, so, so they didn't even wait for the piece to be published, as soon as I contacted Villa and said, essentially, I'd spoken to Gareth, Thoroughly, and he was, he told me these recollections and I wanted obviously their response and comment for the, for the article that I'd be writing. They immediately removed McDonald from coaching duties and they have informed the FA and the EFL and the local authority safeguarding officer uh, and they are having an independent investigation into the bullying, um, 
bullying claims. Um, and I think, going back to your point about, you know, oh, is this old school? You know, I think you've got to be very careful that you don't excuse, and it remains to be seen what the findings are going to be um, from this investigation, but obviously Gareth Farrelly is a very, very credible person, um, and these are his recollections of his treatment. I mean, now, as, as I think people probably know already, but as I put in the piece, since retiring as a footballer, he's qualified as a lawyer now. You know, he knows exactly uh, what he's doing and what the implications are of speaking out publicly in this way. Um, and I think you've got to be very careful looking back on, um, you know, abusive and bullying treatment, whether in sport, whether in schools, whether in workplaces, not to excuse it. Because what are you really saying if you say, well, that's old school? You know, it's not far from saying, well, there just was bullying in the past, so therefore we have to accept it. Are you with me? Yeah. It, it doesn't... It, all, all that's really saying to me, that's old school, is... Yeah, it was tolerated in the past. It doesn't mean it was right or good or positive. And there's an implication when people say that in football. It's not even an implication. People say it explicitly mm. that, well, if you weren't tough enough to take it, uh, you know, that's your problem. Whereas Gareth Farrelly's point, you know, we do, he did deal with this issue when I spoke to him. And he said, I'm just not having that, but this is how it was. Because first of all, it wasn't. We're not talking about the 1930s. We're talking about the mid-1990s. Uh, and even the, the coach that was there before, or head of coaching, Dave Richardson, had a much more, nur not nurturing, but a much more positive and encouraging approach. And he went off to be head of youth development at the Premier League. So even in those days, you, you know, you could argue that that stood out as an approach and that it was moving towards a much more positive, modern uh, approach to coaching. Um, but, but Gareth Farrelly said, he says that it destroyed more people than it, than it produced. Mm. So there's this excuse that, oh, well, that was old school, and if you were tough enough, you know, it did you the world of good. But actually, he's looking back on his own career and saying that he looks back and he feels that for the ability he had as a 17-year-old coming over from Dublin, he actually didn't fulfil his potential, but he was so good that he was always going to play in the Premier League and play international football. But people that he was at Aston Villa with, who were obviously very, very gifted players to be, to be there, did not fulfil their potential and didn't even make it in the game. Yeah, it's uh, it's very revealing stuff. And even in the last sort of 12 hours, having spoken to other uh, former professional footballers who would speak about similar cultures existing at other clubs, um, there's already a sense that maybe this uh, this isn't the end of this, David. I don't know if uh, other people have been in contact with you uh, post the story, post writing the story or if you have a sense of how big this could actually be. Um. Well, I think, uh, I, hope it, I hope that it is going to be big um, because I think that there's a process even for some players themselves or former players themselves to think through, hang on a minute, we just accepted all that because that's just how it was. And, you know, there was this idea of it's old school and, you know, you've got to be tough enough. But actually... Actually, that was wrong. That was abusive. And, and abuse and bullying has a negative impact on people. Like now, the whole... Look at Gareth Southgate and his, and his mode of coaching. Look at Pep. I mean, um, Gareth Farrelly, when we met, was talking about Pep, and I was thinking about putting it in the piece, and he said, you know, look at them. He, he said, look at City and look at how Barcelona used to play. He said, they're playing at the very, very highest level of football. But they're playing, this is what he said, they're playing like they're having a kickabout with their mates in the park. And he thinks that's because with Pep, it's relentlessly positive and it's relentlessly about improvement. It's not relentlessly about telling people that they're rubbish, that they can't play, and, and thinking that the approach is they have to step up to, you know, to prove you wrong. Um, and, you know, I just think modern thinking has looked at that approach and said, well, that just is negative. If you're telling people they're rubbish, they can't play, then they will internalise that they're rubbish and they can't play. Um, and I think, I think most of us know that in our own workplaces, we've responded to, to bosses, if you like, who've encouraged, who've, who've congratulated when you've done well and, and you want that feeling again, you want to do more, you want that feeling of improving. Um, so I, I, do, I do hope that um, this idea that, 
oh, it's old school, it's just how it was. Um, to be honest, I hope that that is demolished in the process of this uh, issue now being discussed. That's when it comes to coaching, David, because if you want to compare the dressing room to, say, the classroom, you'll very rarely see a, a teacher uh, bullying a student, for example, when you compare it to the amount of students bullying other students. So I would certainly look at this as a remarkable story because if it exists from a coaching to a player perspective, surely it existed independent of coaches. Surely there is bullying between players going on as well, not just in the old school days, but in a more high-pressure, high-financed game in the year 2018. Surely the idea of perhaps dressing room bullying between players is a much higher possibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're right. Like, so if you're, if you were at a school, let's say, because we can all relate to that, where there was a very bullying culture from the headmaster down, and uh, you know there was corporal punishment back in the day, and there was rantings from from teachers. Um, I think people can remember that there would be a bullying culture within the school between the kids. So. Is this another old school thing that's tolerated? You know, you hear all these stories uh, about, um, you know, apprentices and uh, they'd come in and the, and the senior players would be horrible to them and they would play awful pranks on them and they would be almost like initiation ceremonies. And again, you know, that's told in a way that, um, uh, that, that, that was old school, that was how it was and you had to be tough enough to, to step up. Uh, to step up to it, but I think, but I think now people recognise that that's wrong. It's negative. It's destructive. Dan Farley used the word destructive. You know that that it destroyed more people than it uh, than it brought through. Um, and I have spoken to players, interviewed players over the years, who've stopped and thought, but actually that was bullying. And it didn't do me any good at all. It was humiliating. It was you know it was something that set me back. Um, and, and, you know, to be honest, I'm really glad that you're appreciating the piece in this way and seeing these elements of it, because I think they're very important, not just in football, but in wider society, aren't they? For people to really try and think this through and separate in their minds what, um, what constitutes decent conduct and encouraging conduct and, and, and um, you know, um, proper, proper nurture between older mentors and younger people mm. and what constitutes abuse. Yeah, like just, just thinking of that again, because I was just about to ask, putting it into a wider context as well, that even if you go back to the education system, I'm sure it's the same in the UK, but there is such an effort to actually stamp out things like bullying in the education system. There is education of teachers, education of students from teachers to actually stop this. I do wonder, did the PFA do anything like this? It seems that you know, too often we treat uh, footballers as grown men, but in actual fact, a lot of what happens here comes under the umbrella of people who, who just aren't mature enough to realise that they're perhaps bullying somebody else. Are the PFA or the FA perhaps uh, instigating any sort of education campaigns in terms of anti-bullying measures? Um, I'm not sure, but I do think that the culture within academies um, now is it's definitely um, like like whether all clubs abide by it is a different thing. But in terms of what the policies are, a hundred percent, it's supposed to be about positive nurture, positive development, positive encouragement. It's anti-bullying. It's anti-abuse. It's not about negativity anymore. And I mean. The idea that it was old school and um, that's just how it was back in the day. As I say, this was in, nine, in the mid-1990s. It was not in the 1950s. Um, and I was doing quite a lot of reporting, actually, on youth football in the mid-1990s. And I remember going to Lillyshaw. It was when England, uh, the FA, still had its... Uh, it was three academy days, so they had this elite school at Lillyshaw for just, I think, 16 pupils. And Sol Campbell went there, Joe Cole went there, Scott Parker went there. Um, you know, there were quite a few that, that did come through and make it at a very top level. And I remember going to watch um, them play, that team play, and all the kids were really encouraging each other. I can remember Joe Cole uh, playing as a 15-year-old saying, you know, great ball, whoever it was, well done, and really noticing that all the calling during the game was positive and not, ah, oh, why didn't you play that into my power? Not negative. And they had obviously been taught, and this is at exactly the same time as Gareth Farrelly was suffering from 
day after day after day um, what he says was, was verbal and physical abuse at Aston Villa. They'd obviously been taught positive, positive, positive. That's the atmosphere that we want. And to be honest, obviously I was a lot older than them and I was already working as a journalist and that's why I was there. I, I learned from that myself. I actually learned from that and thought, wow, you know, this is so positive how these people... And even in my own football efforts, I am relentlessly positive about great ball, great effort, and, and don't really comment if it wasn't a great ball or a great effort. Um, and I think that the general... And that was, as I say, more than 20 years ago. Mm. And, and obviously, the FA school at Lillishall was at the cutting edge of what the FA thinking was on coaching at that time. So, yes, um, to answer your question, I'm sure that the overall philosophy of, of academies uh, is of positive encouragement, positive nurture. And I, I think that if, if this piece can blow the myth, and Gareth Farrelly talks about it as a myth, I don't buy the myth that this produced players. Because he's saying, I mean, Gareth Barry, I think they, they got him already as an outstanding teenager, I think, from Brighton. Um, and others that came through, Lee Hendry, uh, you know, there aren't that many, to be honest. Right, for a start, there aren't that many. When you think that Aston Villa was, and still is really a top club, a prestige name, so they've got the pick of, um, they've just got the pick of young players, along with, uh, you, you know, okay, not the Manchester United, the Manchester City, but, you know, along with the Southamptons and, and, you know, that sort of level. There aren't that many who've come through, and he's saying, you know, the ones that come through, he's one of them. He did come through, but he rejects the idea that that was because of coaching by Kevin McDonald. He didn't even want me to use the word coaching mm. in relation to Kevin McDonald. Um, so um, I think, and he says, I just don't buy that myth that you can look at the results and say, well, well, that shows that, you know, that approach bore fruit. Are you with me? Yeah. He's saying that there are kids that are going to make it and, are they, and some of them are going to be at Aston Villa because of the name that Aston Villa's got. But that doesn't mean that you can justify any treatment that happened during their time there. And if someone's turning around 20 years later and putting themselves on the line and saying, this is what happened, this is what happened to me, and it's unacceptable, and when it's someone as credible as Gareth Farrelly, then obviously you have to take it very, very seriously, and that is what Aston Villa have done this time. Yeah, I know, having uh, watched a pretty instructive uh, interview with Paul Stewart uh, this week, I think it was on the BBC, where he spoke about the sexual abuse that he'd received as a player and uh, the relevance of that in 2018. Um, it really drove it home for me about how we tend to talk about these stories as being a thing of the past, when actually in a lot of cases they, that may not be exactly the case. One thing we did want to ask you about, um, Dave, was that obviously we mentioned at the top about Kevin, McVo uh, Kevin McDonald's involvement with the FAI and there's some pretty, again, instructive stuff from Gareth Farley about his, how disparaging he was about uh, Gareth's involvement with Ireland at that time. Have you, um, I'm interested to know if there's been any reaction from, I suppose, the PFA or the FA or indeed the FAI on this? I haven't had anything yet, and I actually didn't approach the football authorities over this because I thought, um, well, we know that Villa um, did not deal with the modern complaint properly, and there has been a change of regime at Aston Villa. There's been a, uh, a, a takeover, effectively, and there's a new chief executive now, Christian Perslow, um, who has responded you know, very rapidly and in a completely different way. To, to the previous regime. We know that the Premier League investigated. They say that they... Not they say, I accept that they insisted on certain changes being made to practice at the academy um, and that Donald was moved to work with the under-23s. I know that the FA conducts an investigation, but the FA's only role in this regard is actual safeguarding, OK? And the safe... Not, not quality of academy. They... They don't regulate that. That's the Premier League. And the actual safeguarding issue only applies to minors, right? So the fact that they'd moved Kevin McDonald to work with the under-23s mm. meant that the FA had to conclude that there was not a safeguarding issue. So Kevin McDonald's still around, uh, obviously, heavily uh, heavily involved uh, at the academy before, before this week. Um, and um, to be honest, that's one of the things on my on my list is I would like to get under the skin of what actually did happen 
with that Aston Villa investigate, so-called investigation, and why did they not act properly uh, last year and two years ago? Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't put it again to uh, the FA in the Premier League because I know what their position is. Um, but I hope that what's actually happened this time um, is, uh, you know, I think so far Aston Villa have responded in quite a model way. And I hope that this is a lesson to the FA, the Premier League and the other clubs, that when these issues are raised, I mean, this was the parent of a boy who was there, mm. then they have to be addressed properly. Yeah, the the specifics of that story were around 94, 95, and it appears in your article uh, in, in The Guardian in relation to uh, Garrett's call-up to Ireland, uh, Mick McCarthy at, at the time as it happened, um, and the sneering nature of uh, McDonald's response to him. Uh, I hope you don't think you're a player now. Those fucking Mickey Mouse caps you've got, uh, and his dismay, his further dismay after that when Kevin McDonald was obviously appointed assistant manager of Ireland, uh, under the manager, uh, Steve Staunton, at that time, so um, I'm yeah, sure and, and, Gar and Gareth, Gareth Farrelly was very emphatic about wanting to make that point um, that uh, that he'd been disparaging about the caps, and then, and also from a personal point of view, going to Ireland to play for Ireland had been a real respite for him because he said that the under twenty one coach Ian Evans and Mick McCarthy themselves were great. <laughs> and this is the other thing about oh, well, it was old school. Well, Ian Evans and Mick McCarthy weren't like that to the players. They were encouraging, they were positive, they were, they did have good coaching, you know, to pass on to the players, they did teach them. So, you know, it wasn't like, well, everyone around was, was exactly the same. And uh, his dismay when Kevin McDonald turns up as the assistant manager of the Republic of Ireland, both because of what his attitude had been before and because of what he was actually like and sort of closing off that... Uh, that escape that that, that Gareth Farrelly had, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it, it's, yeah, it's powerful, isn't it? You know, it's, um, it's quite, it's quite uh, arresting um, to think about what his feelings must have been when, when Kevin McDonald turned up to be the assistant manager of Ireland. So Villa are going to have, uh, they say they're going to have an in independent investigation now. Kevin McDonald has been removed from uh, working with players. He's not been suspended from employment at the club. And um, the investigation will be in touch with Gareth Farrelly and we'll see what happens. Yeah, David, you've done great work bringing Gareth's story to uh, light this morning and uh, communicating it for us as well. Thanks, William, for taking the call. Thanks very much and thanks very much for your interest as always. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. David Connor, the line there of The Guardian. I'm absolutely certain that it's not the last of this type of story that we're going to hear. No, definitely not. As I was saying there, I think it's going to be one of the if we if every story like this came to light i would say the idea of a coach to a player mm. bullying and that dynamic would actually be one of the rarer ones like yeah the old school thing was absolutely something that bounced out from the article for me and Garrett's insistence that let's not just write this off as um there will be players out there like we've spoken to them a million times in the show who they'll They'll almost have a laugh about the fact that a, a coach or a player was had a certain demeanour when it came to this old school coaching, which um, at times clearly stepped over the line. And the importance of not just writing this off as, well, sure, look at he was old school, and that's just the way things were, just not acceptable. No, there is also though kind of a, an element of the the merits of that service for certain people and the damage it does to other people. Like Kenny Cunningham was sitting here yesterday and saying that he much preferred whenever he scored an own goal to be told right off by somebody, mm -hmm. whereas other players would prefer an arm around uh, the shoulder and stuff. Mm -hmm. And perhaps just a, a little more intuition when it comes to what each player requires is yeah. uh, required.